Out of all the things we do as web developers, dealing with color might be one of the most frustrating. It's both an art and a science, and if you're more development-minded, that can be a frustrating thing to deal with, especially if you don't have an eye for design. And while some clever developers have come up with really robust frameworks that deal with particular color spaces and exact math equations, in most cases, I find those kinds of things a little bit overkill for the types of projects I'm working on. This actually came up inside of our community not long ago, and I shared the framework that I've been building over the years in a quick comment. That comment ended up getting a lot of traction, and I promised that I would do a follow-up video to discuss it in a little bit more detail, so here we are today. Now, if you learn better by reading, I have created a companion to this video that's a written article that covers all the things we're going to talk about in this video today. That link, of course, is down in the description. But if you could use a simple, reliable, and practical color framework for your website projects, then stick around and let's talk about it. The idea of this framework is for it to be flexible enough that it works with just about any brand, portable so I can use it from project to project, but comprehensive enough that it gives you a polished considered design. To accomplish that, I think we really need to take advantage of custom properties or CSS variables. If you haven't dealt with custom properties before, I put a link down in the description where I did a quick crash course on it because you're gonna need to be familiar with custom properties and how they work in order to get the most out of this video. Essentially what custom properties are going to do are give us a placeholder name that's friendly and easy to remember instead of having to memorize a bunch of different hex values. This means that we can easily swap out the actual colors from project to project, but use the same naming convention over and over. This goes a long way to making your projects go smoother and being able to create a more repeatable process. I also try to follow the 60-30-10 rule, which is a principle in design that helps create visual balance and make sure that you're using the colors in an appropriate way that creates visual harmony. This means that my color palette ends up having three families within it. There's the base color, which is used for the 60% of things, the brand color, which we use for 30% of the design, and the action color, which is used for only 10% of the design. But let's dive in a little bit deeper to each one of those different families and talk about how we set them up and how we use them. The base family within my color palette ends up being the most robust since it ends up occupying about 60% of the design. I use it for things like backgrounds, text, shadows, and subtle design accents. It typically consists of a range of neutral colors. To make this system portable into every project, it's important we use a naming convention that makes sense. So for my base colors, I use the word base followed by a dash and then a numeric value starting with zero for pure white and ending at 900 for my darkest color. These numbers increment up by 100 in between each step. So it ends up being something like base 0, base 100, base 200, and so on. Incrementing by 100 gives us the same convention for font weights, which is something we're already used to, and it gives us the ability to fit in in between numbers when necessary. So we could use 250 for a shade that's a little bit darker than 200, but a little bit lighter than 300. As for the actual color values for my base colors, these should be neutral, but I'll often tint them either slightly cool or slightly warm based on the company's branding. Now that may sound complicated, but I'm really not trying to reinvent the wheel here. Tailwind actually has a great set of base colors that include stone, neutral, zinc, gray, and slate, and I've listed all of these out in order of warmest to coolest. My only tweak to the Tailwind palettes is that I add a base zero as a pure white and rarely incorporate a 950 color. Now, if you've not worked with a palette like this before, you might be kind of shocked to see how many different variations there are for essentially what's gray. But in my experience, having these different colors actually goes a long way into creating a more polished look. In the physical world, we might only use one paint color for our walls, but all the different light sources and shadows create an endless array of tints and shades. By creating something similar in our base palette, we make designs that look a little bit more polished and realistic. Just to give you a sense of how I use this palette, for the base zero, that's used for backgrounds of cards or anything I want to give the illusion of sitting on top of my primary background because base 100 is almost always the primary background throughout my site. And it's typically just slightly darker than white or lighter than black if you're in dark mode, but we'll tackle that later on in this video. Base 200 is used for subtle accents and some shadows. 300 is most often my border colors. 600 is used for light text. 700 is my body text. 800, sometimes I will use that for headlines, and 900 is reserved for dark background sections or when I need slightly more contrast. That's not to say I don't use these colors differently, and I do from project to project, but I wanted to give you some kind of starting point to kind of see how to actually apply these colors. 
Now you might've noticed I left out 400 and 500 from my list here. And while I do keep those in my palette, just for continuity's sake, I find myself not needing the 400 or 500 variations very often. Those mid-tones can often muddy up a design and don't offer enough contrast for anything with text. So I find they're a lot less usable. Now, I hope you're not feeling too overwhelmed. I realized I promised you a simple and straightforward framework, and I promise you the most complicated bit is done. And now as we move into our brand color, things start to get a little bit more simplified. Now, what I call the brand color inside of this framework is actually the brand's primary brand color. Sometimes brands will just have one color besides anything you might classify as a neutral color, and other times they might have two or more colors. But even when there's more colors involved, there's usually one color that's used more prominently throughout their designs than others. That's what we're going to use here for our brand color. Unlike the base palette, which has a large number of tints and shades, I tend to only use two variations in the brand family. The first is the brand color itself, which I call brand, alongside an either darker or lighter version of the brand color that I can use for interactions like a hover color. I'll usually call this brand alt, as there isn't really enough colors to make the whole zero to 900 naming convention very useful. Now there are times and situations where I do find I need more variations than just the primary brand and the alt version. And for those situations, you can always revert back to the zero to 900 naming convention. And I've left a link down in the description for a website that will actually generate you all the different tints and shades of your brand color. It works similarly to the way the shades in the Tailwind framework, and I tend to like that quite a bit. For myself, I prefer using the base family for these types of accents, but like I said, sometimes I do need to use the brand color for this. For our brand color, we're wanting to use this for about 30% of our design. This means I tend to use this for things like icons, links, buttons, or even backgrounds for my CTA sections. Sometimes I will use the brand color for headlines, but sometimes color text can get a little bit obnoxious. The last color I use inside my color palette is the action color, which ends up getting used most sparingly. Out of the 60-30-10 principle, it's the 10% color. Now like the brand color, I tend to have two variations of my action color, action and action alt. This gives me a slight variation of the action color for hover states and other interactions. As for its use, I try to use it as sparingly as possible. Because it's often the most bright color in the palette, and because I'm using it the least frequently, that can really draw a user's eye to those primary calls to action, so when you use it responsibly and don't overuse it, you can really manipulate how the user views the website by just a simple use of color. When it's all done, the palette should look something like this. But let's take a practical look at what these palettes can look like in action, and I'll wrap things up by sharing a few tips for accessibility and how you can adapt this framework for dark modes. In this first design, we can see the brand has two colors, a blue and a pink. The base colors are used for the background, the subtle design accents, and the text. The brand color is used for this hero background, the current page indicator in the navigation menu, and the H2 headlines in the second section. The action color was only used for the background of the primary CTA button, prompting users to schedule an appointment. Because of its bright color and sparse use, your eyes are actually drawn to these areas of the page, which is a great use for this action color. On this site, however, we have just one brand color, blue, so we've dropped the action color. Again, these base colors are handling the text and backgrounds, but here the brand color is featured more prominently as a highlight and the call to action color. Now this can still look really good, and you might even argue that it's more common in designs today. However, because of the things we can do with the action color to really highlight the main focus of a page, I tend to try to use an action color anytime I can. And in fact, if a brand only has one color and their brand guidelines don't strictly prohibit it, I might find a complementary color to use as an action color just so I can really draw the user's eye when I need to. Now, one of the really neat things about this framework is that it easily adapts to dark mode. You could simply use the darker base colors, 700, 800, 900, as the backgrounds of your site and the light colors like 100, 200, and 300 as the text colors. But what I prefer is just reversing the palette. What I mean by that is base 100 becomes my darkest color and base 900 becomes my lightest. This way I can still assign the same color variables to the different parts of my website, like base 100 is still my site's background, but instead of having a light theme, I have a dark theme instead. Of course, when we're creating a color palette, it's important that we keep accessibility in mind. And this means making sure that our colors adhere to a WCAG AA guideline at a minimum. 
Now, when it comes to actually executing this, there are two websites that I keep bookmarked that help me out a ton. The first is Learn UI's Accessible Contrast Color Tool. It's one of my favorites because not only will it give you a pass or a fail for both AA and AAA guidelines, but it will also suggest tints and shades that will pass if yours didn't. The other really handy tool is creating an accessible color matrix. This will show you which colors can be used in combination, so you can easily make guidelines on which color text belongs on each background inside your color palette. In the end, how you use your colors is just as important, if not more important, than the actual colors themselves. What I really like about this framework is it kind of defaults to using the 60-30-10 principle, which we talked about earlier, and it's easily portable from project to project. Of course, there's no one palette that's going to work for every single situation. I find myself needing to tweak or adjust this in just about every case, so if you run into a project where this doesn't fit exactly and you feel like you need more or less colors, don't sweat that. You can always make adjustments to this. I would really think of this as a starting place, although there are projects where this is the exact palette I use all the way through. Hopefully you got some value out of this video and it's going to make it easier for you to select colors. If you did, I would really appreciate a thumbs up, and if you want to make sure to catch me on future videos, go ahead and hit subscribe, and we'll see you then.